Hi, I'm Jamie, and welcome to the Ant Lab Australia. Today, we're going to continue our introduction to ant keeping series. If you missed the first episode about catching queens, the link is right here. Before we get into this episode, we would like to thank the ant keeping community for the amazing feedback and support we received to our very first video. Thank you so much. It has given us a huge boost in confidence in the content that we can produce for you all. And thanks to that feedback, we have some extra queen catching tips from the community that we will share with you at the end of this video. So stick around. Now, as everyone likes to say on YouTube, let's get to it. In episode one, we referred to two different types of queens that you're likely to catch in relation to how they start their colonies, clostral and semi-clostral. We should take the time now to mention that there are also other ways for ants to start a colony, but you'll be less likely to need to know these, at least at the beginning of your ant keeping. There are species that are socially parasitic. This means they take over an established colony of usually a different species. Others that after their nuptial flight, go back to their original colony or another established colony of the same species. Still other species in which the colony splits and two or more queens go different ways with part of the workers and brood. These are obviously harder to replicate in the ant keeping world, so we will leave it alone this week and cover these species in future episodes. You will likely recognize the Latin origin of the term clostral, clostrum, meaning an enclosed space from the term claustrophobia. And that enclosed space is just what the queen needs, with just enough room to perhaps turn around in and not much more. So let's look at how to make a setup to reflect that. For those of you that are new to the ant keeping world, the preferred and easiest method of housing your claustral queens is in test tubes. The method is fairly simple. Clean filtered water in the end of a tube is separated off with a tightly wadded up cotton ball. This gives her a water source and a moisture gradient that she'll need to raise her brood. Then you seal the other end with another cotton ball. This allows for a little airflow but keeps her comfortably sealed away. The hard part now for ant keepers is leaving her alone in the test tube in a dark, temperature controlled area. Not too hot, not too cold. Depending on the species and the queen herself, it can be a couple of days, weeks, or even months until she will lay her first clutch of eggs. Although clostral queens need no further sustenance in this setup, many keepers like to offer the tiniest drop of honey or sugar water to give her a head start in raising her brood. Her semi-clostral sisters, on the other hand, will require sustenance from the time they dig their founding chamber till their first generation of workers, called ninitics, emerge from their pupae stage. Semi-clostral species, unlike their clostral counterparts, do not have the overly enlarged gaster and or mesosoma to store the excess fats and proteins needed to sustain themselves for months on end and feed their brood. The enlarged body structure typical of a clostral queen is an evolutionary trait believed to have come about in response to the high mortality rate of queens that need to forage. On the other hand, a lighter build would likely make foraging queens better adapted at hunting and foraging. Foraging areas in ant keeping setups go by the fancy nomenclature of outworlds. Outworlds can be as fancy as a CNC cut perspex ventilated cube or as simple as a sealable takeaway container. These outworlds can either contain the previously mentioned test tube or can be connected to the opening of the test tube. Ant keepers like to call these semi claustral setups the tubs and tubes method. In an upcoming episode, we will explain how to set up a few different variations of this method so you can experiment and find what best suits you. Regardless of what setup you use, the purpose is the same. Your queen needs a place to go scavenging and she will need food of two types to raise her brood. For her own sustenance, she needs carbohydrates usually in the form of sugars. These must be given in a liquid form as ants can't eat solid food. Options include raw honey, maple syrup, sugar water, that is one part sugar to one part water, or even fresh fruits. The other source of food is for her brood. Once hatched from their eggs as larvae, the queen will be feeding her brood proteins. These can be provided to her in the forms of feeder insects, 
like mealworms, crickets, roaches, and the like. Or you can buy protein jelly or powders specifically designed for ants. We will go into more depth about feeding in another upcoming episode. Semiclostrals are harder to raise, needing frequent monitoring right from the outset to ensure they're receiving enough food to keep her and her brood alive. But I feel personally that they're the most rewarding, as we as ant keepers get so much more involved with her right from the beginning, helping her to establish a healthy and vibrant colony. Now, as I promised at the beginning of the episode, we have a couple of tips from our subscribers in response to our first video on catching queens. If you haven't seen that one yet, do check it out. Our first tip is one that has been quite helpful this last week here in Perth. As we pointed out in the last episode, the elates fly in response to warmer weather. Well, you can actually put a number on that. 25 degrees Celsius. That's 77 for our Fahrenheit fans. When you get your first few days of 25 degrees or more, make sure you have your queen catching kit on you, as there will be queens aplenty. Just this week, we've had a couple of days in the mid to high 20s, and we have seen Rhydiptopanera metallica, Brachypanera lutea, a few species of Iridomermex, and also some Camponotus, many of which prefer flying in the afternoons and evenings. Our second tip from the community is more about a location that gets overlooked for finding queens. Or more to the point, finding live queens. Your backyard pool. Yes, on those warm days, the reflections from your pool will attract the lates. But don't despair at finding queens floating dead in the pool. Your queens are very resilient and can actually survive up to six hours floating like that. So next time you see a floating queen, carefully fish her out and place her on a piece of kitchen towel to dry out, and you may be in luck. We hope you have enjoyed this episode and learned something new. If you like what we're producing, your support would be fantastic. So hit that like button and subscribe, and we will keep striving to bring you excellent videos. Thanks for watching. I'm Jamie, and we are the Ant Lab Australia.